and welcome to Worship. My name is Olivia Osterhage, and I'm blessed to serve as the Director of Marketing and Outreach here at First St. Charles. We want to make sure to welcome everyone who is joining us for this service, and especially any first-time viewers. We're so happy that you're here, and we hope that you know that you are safe, welcome, and wanted at First St. Charles. If you wouldn't mind, take a second to head over to our website and fill out the Connect card so we know that you're with us. And if it is your first time joining us, be sure to mention that on the Connect card because we have a special little gift that we would love to mail to you. Well, in two Sundays, we're going to be having our Kids Against Hunger Packing Day. This is going to be on May 5th from 8 a.m. to noon, and we're going to be packing 15,000 meals that will go to people who desperately need it around the world. We really need your help for this, so if you can join us, come on May 5th to help for Kids Against Hunger. In just a little bit, Reverend Dr. Bart Hildreth will be continuing the sermon series titled, Love Lives. And now let's continue to worship with our call to worship. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within our hearts. Okay, Counselor Mrs. R, you can do this. It's the big show. It's Camp Firelight. You're brave. You're outdoorsy. You're not ready for this. I'm so nervited. I could really use some help to get ready for VBS. Where is Lumen? He's supposed to be here by now. <laughs> Hi, Lou. Hello. Oh, so sorry I'm late. Better light than never. What are you doing? I'm so glad you're here. Well, I'm thinking about VBS. I'm nervited. I'm afraid we won't have everything ready in time for campfire light. Nervited? What's that? Well, I'm feeling nervous and excited about campfire light VBS. Nervited. Oh, I see. Now seems like a great time to share the camp call out from Psalm 56 verse 3. It says, whenever I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. You must trust that God will bless this VBS with all of the help and support needed. So what do you need? Oh, thanks for sharing that, Lou. It's just what I needed to be reminded of. So we need people going into sixth grade all the way to adults to sign up for opportunities to serve, to lead, and most of all, have fun with our next generation at Camp Firelight. Each of us plays an important role inspiring our campers to put their trust in God. Right you are. So enlighten us. What opportunities are available? Well, we need people to lead the science craft station, the recreation station, the music station, camp counselor guides, the welcome team, a nurse, nursery care, preschool leaders, well, decorating setup and takedown, 
a media specialist to run technology, help at the registration table, dinner servers, and more. This is an amazing opportunity for the congregation of First Church to live out our mission to gather new people to Christ, grow in Christ, and go for Christ. What are the dates? We need to get them on our calendars. On the evenings of June 26th, 27th, and 28th from 5.30 to 7.45 p.m. But we also need help preparing materials ahead of time and to decorate and to clean up after camp is over. Well, let's get the glow on the road. How can people sign up? Well, the tech savvy volunteers can scan the QR code right here in the video or the QR code on the flyer that's at the welcome desk in the church atrium. You can also register on the church's website at the top of the registration page, click on volunteer sign up. You glow girl. This is going to be an amazing adventure with God. What can people do in the meantime? Pray, prayerfully consider joining our team and tell others about VBS. We wanna reach as many campers as we can. It's never too light to learn. I'm ready to trust God and sign up today. I hope you'll join our team. My name is Keith Janis, and I have the joy of serving as the pastor for senior adults. You know, oftentimes when we talk about supporting the church, we're talking about supporting the church monetarily. But there are ways in which you can support the church through your time and your talents. And one of those ways is our VBS program this year. If you're local with us and you would like to be part of that program, you can do so by signing up on our website. The kids need our support to make sure that that program is a smashing success. And of course, as you know, there are other ministries in the church that can use your financial support. No matter what you give or how much you give, we appreciate all that you have done for us. Now let us take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. As we read and hear your word, inspire in us both the mission of Jesus, our crucified Lord, and also the vision of Jesus, our risen Savior. Lord, you meet us in unexpected places and surprise us with abundance of your love. We make our journey to you in worship, and we thank you for the safe travels and the fellowship we find here. For those who have not found their way to you yet, we ask blessings on their journeys. For we are all pilgrims on that path, on a journey that takes us into your heart. Help us to know that though the road may be rough in spots, we are never left alone on the way. May we feel your presence in this place today and in all ways. Give us thankful hearts, Lord, that we may share the gifts we have been given with those who are in need. Help us share our resources and talents to carry on ministry in your name and to your glory. By your grace, accept the fruit of our labor and the offering of our lives. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and glory forever. Amen.
scripture comes from the book of Acts, chapter 8. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip, At noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Candace. Candace is the title given to the Ethiopian queen. He was reading the prophet Isaiah while sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, approach this carriage and stay with it. Running up to the carriage, Philip heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you really understand what you are reading? The man replied, without someone to guide me, how could I? Then he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This was the passage of scripture he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was taken away from him. Who can tell the story of his descendants because his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, about whom does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Starting with that passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, Look, water! What would keep me from being baptized? He ordered that the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, where Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Lord's Spirit suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself in Azotus. He traveled through the region, preaching the good news in all the cities until he reached Caesarea. In the reading of the written word, God's word lives in our lives. In the loving of our lives, the living Christ is resurrected in our world. Thanks be to God. The Ethiopian eunuch was one of the first people to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the people of Africa. But they certainly weren't the last. While Lara Petros was not an ordinary woman, you see, she had to get married because that's what you were supposed to do back in the day. And you really had no choice about who you got to marry. So her family gave her in marriage to a military leader who was best friends with the king. So on all accounts, Waletta had a good life. And when Waletta when would host parties, she invited the senior pastor of her church and other pastors in town and her council person and the mayor and the bank president. And she also invited those who experienced their share of struggles, those couch surfing from relative to friend back to relative, carrying their, ba their possessions in reusable bags, those kind of folks you see at the ramps when you get off the highway holding up a sign. And she made sure everyone had a seat at the table. And she'd watch as they feasted on steak, as the mayor passed the, the garlic bread to the hitchhiker, as the bishop went around filling empty wine glasses. Now this clearly was not a Methodist church. And when her husband won off to a military campaign, Waletta ran away toward a convent because she wanted to live a holy life. Well, her husband got angry and found out and ran after her and eventually captured her. But she pleaded and convinced him to release her so finally she could achieve her one goal in life, to become a nun. Now, she wasn't only a nun. She was a preacher. And the king, well, the king didn't like it. You see, European colonists convinced him to convert to their way of Christianity. But Waletta, 
Now Mother Walletta was having nothing of it. She preached her Ethiopian faith. The same faith handed to her first from the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts, but 1,600 years later. The same faith, faith that Jesus encouraged in Luke chapter 14. Do you remember that story? When Jesus noticed everyone at the party taking the most important seats by the most important people, he told a story about a person who invited the important leaders to dinner. And when they did not show up, the person instead invited guests who were unhoused. Guests who may have been hard to love. Guests who weren't sure what fork to use and didn't wash their hands the proper way. Jesus implied that those were the people that would be welcome in the kingdom. Now, Jesus' story was a parable. A tale that wasn't literal, but meant to communicate truth. But Mother Walletta she was a real person. She was born in 1592 and died in November of 1642 at the age of 50. A monk was commissioned to write a book about her life around 30 years later, consulting with the people who had known her. And 350 years after that, we finally have an English translation of this woman theologian who referenced over 40 books of the Bible and her story and defied anyone who would make her compromise her call or her faith. Mother Walletta was the real deal in manuscripts in Ethiopia and around the world confirm it. And I wonder, I wonder what the Ethiopian might have felt like 2,000 years ago in the book of Acts. On the one hand, they, like Walletta, had it all. They had regular one-on-one -on -one meetings with the queen. They could access and read any book they wanted. They knew lots and lots of languages, Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and Akkadian, just to start out with. So there was no surprise when the Ethiopian had a Greek copy of those Hebrew scriptures and was reading along as, he, as they traveled. They found those scriptures so fascinating that they came to Jerusalem to worship and see what this one true God thing was about. And while the Ethiopian was wealthy and smart, they were also an outcast, too. As one scholar says, the Ethiopian eunuch defies categorization. Defies category. The Ethiopian's background wasn't Jewish, but they were interested in some of the things of the Jewish faith, so they lived in this in-between space. They could participate in some of the Jewish rituals, but not all of them. The Ethiopian wasn't from Rome or from the Middle East, but, thought, but hundreds of miles south of there. And while in the Old Testament we hear a little bit about the descendants of Cush settling in the area now known as Ethiopia, at least in the New Testament, this is the only time Ethiopia is mentioned. And not only, not only was the Ethiopian an outcast according to their religion and their location, the Ethiopian eunuch also felt in between because of their gender. As a eunuch, they weren't considered male nor female, and so they couldn't follow those religious rituals that depended upon a strict gender binary. Now, their gender, gender identity was probably something they did not choose, but something forced upon them to keep them from being too powerful and too threatening. As a eunuch, 
they would always play a supporting role. Perhaps an important supporting role. But in their day, they'd never get to be the main character. And they couldn't have certain jobs or what you might consider a normal family structure. You know, a house with 2.4 kids and a dog. And in spite of, or perhaps because of their in-between status, they were perfect to be one of the queen's top advisors. Someone the queen didn't have to worry about. And as they traveled back from Jerusalem with the queen's treasures in tow, they immersed themselves in reading the book of Isaiah. The roads winded across the hills. And because the Ethiopian chariot was quite large, they had to travel not the most direct route, but they had to wind their way from Jerusalem to get back home. And suddenly, suddenly, they saw a man jogging up to the carriage. And the man was clearly a Galilean. He looked a bit rough, and he looked like he had been through something. So this man with dirty with a dirty shirt and with calluses on his feet jogged alongside the carriage, and he gasped between breaths. And he asked, what are you reading? Do you know what it's about? And I imagine the Ethiopian in their fancy traveling clothes was more than a bit surprised. Who was this dude? Was this just a ploy so he could rob them? And what kind of person jogs alongside carriages? Well, the Ethiopian sees that there's no weapons on the man, so he invites them to jump on in and sit in the passenger seat. Frustrated that they had always been in this in-between position, frustrated by the continual lack of clarity, the Ethiopian asked the man, I have no idea what this is saying. Nobody would explain it to me. And so they both look at the text together, Isaiah 53. The passage was about a suffering servant. The servant, like the eunuch, was teased and humiliated because of things beyond his control. The servant, like the eunuch, would have no biological descendants. And the Ethiopian, seeing themselves in that story, asks the Galilean man, asks Philip, what this passage is about. To whom, to whom does this passage refer? And so Philip, led by the Holy Spirit, begins to explain about Jesus. Jesus who told the story about the kingdom of heaven looking like outcasts feasting at the table after the important people ignored the invitation. Jesus, who got in trouble hanging out with tax collectors and criminals. Jesus, who followed God's love rather than his nation's power. Jesus, who was considered treasonous. Jesus, who suffered and died unjustly. Jesus, who conquered death so that we may all have life. After listening to Philip explain about Jesus, the two persons traveled in silence for a bit. Then they saw a small river, not far off the road. And the Ethiopian turns to Philip and asks, What prevents me from being baptized? And it's an interesting question to ask. 
I wonder how many pastors have been asked this. I've never heard of any stories in my Baptist or Methodist life of people asking this question. Maybe because I haven't been listening, or maybe because I have mostly hung around with Christians. But perhaps, perhaps this question makes sense given its context. As my friend Jennifer Bashaw says, who's a New Testament professor, she says that the Ethiopian had been rejected a lot. They couldn't participate in all the Jewish rituals, nor could they participate in all the rituals of their homeland. They had always, always been circling the outside edges, never fully being embraced by their community. They expected rejection. They anticipated it. They didn't assume they'd be included. They presumed that expectations of belonging would be something out of their control. But that's not what happened. Philip stopped the chariot. They both got out and waded into the water. The Ethiopian's purple and gold robes floated in the water like a mermaid. And Philip's muddy tunic swirled around him as his feet sunk in the mud. And Philip baptized the Ethiopian in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And finally, 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 the Ethiopian had a family, had a sense of belonging. Nothing prevented them from God's family. Nothing, nothing separated them from God's love. And I can't help but wonder, like my friend Jennifer did, how this story would look like today. People are still asking, what prevents me from being loved and accepted by Christ's community? What prevents me from making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? And sometimes the answer is a lot. My first semester of seminary, I was in one of those classes that teaches you the seminary basics, like spiritual formation and pastoral care and just how to be a pastor, one of those one-on-one level courses. And that last class period, the last class period of the semester, we were in a circle and one of the women in my class just breaks down crying. She had begun seminary and had begun the licensing procedure only to be told that because she was too old, she couldn't be ordained. See, she had grown up in a church that didn't ordain women and then later in life switched denominations to one that did. However, unbeknownst to her, that denomination put in place age limits on ordination. And she realized at the end of the first semester that after decades of lay ministry in various places, she could not follow her call to be a pastor. Today, in some churches and faith communities, people from the margins continue to ask, What prevents me from being baptized? What prevents me from fully participating in the life of the church? People who are LGBTQ plus ask, what prevents me from living out my call in ministry? What happens happens if God calls me and the church rejects me? 
What happens? What happens if I live into who God calls me to be? And my family abandons me. Fear of rejection is a reality in churches and our community. And rightfully so. We only have to look at the news to confirm it. Now, unfortunately, we don't know what happens to Philip, what happens after Philip baptizes the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian returns to their chariot, their clothes heavy with water, rejoicing and praising God. They don't care that their clothes have been ruined. They don't care that they're behind in their travel. They've received the gift of Jesus Christ. The gift of a new family in Christ. The gift of being accepted just as they are. And Philip, led by the Spirit, continues to make disciples for the transformation of the world. And the Ethiopian, too, continues to live out the Great Commission. I imagine that the Ethiopian became one of the first preachers in their land. And they would tell other people on the margins, like the eunuchs and the servants, that this person, about this person, Jesus Christ, whose love lives on. They told Queen Candace and the leaders that they worked for that this Jesus didn't care how much money you had or what your ranking was because Christ's love conquered any hierarchy we created. And they told their fellow eunuchs that family didn't have to be biological, but based on the worship and love of Christ. And soon afterward, the church in Africa was established. The church where Mother Waleta, 1,600 years later, would share that same message, even defying kings and welcoming outcasts and quoting scripture and collecting friends on the way. And so, and so today, we continue to fulfill that scripture in Acts 8. And in Acts 1, verse 8, where Jesus tells the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Love lives, even and especially in the in-between places. What are the things that prevent people from belonging in the community of Christ today? Are there people that you'd still prefer to keep out? Today's invitation to discipleship is to examine your own heart and determine if there are people that you're preventing from knowing that love lives. And then, consider what it would take to become a Philip for them, to become a person who radically welcomes people to Jesus. And now, as you're able, in body or spirit, stand to receive this blessing. May you know that nothing prevents you from following Christ, from belonging in Christ, and from living in Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of all, and to all God's people said, Amen.